Um, so uh, as orthopedic surgeons, we like to, to look at x-rays, and you can't really do a talk with orthopedic surgeon without putting up x-rays. And we like to fix fractures. So this is a, similar to a guy I saw that came in last night and fixed him just before I came here. 81-year-old uh, guy. He's had a history of prostate cancer treated with um, some uh, radiation and some anti-androgenic medications in the past. And he has a ground level fall and sustains this uh, fracture that we're all looking at. And everybody can decide, you know, what would I do with that? And I'm sure that's what's going through everyone's mind. Uh, and that's what we do. Um, so let's start thinking about what we might do in, as an adjunct to this rather than just fixing the bones. Uh, and what should we do? And let's think about why this person had this uh, fracture in the first place. So we'll talk about what is a fragility fracture. It's a fracture that occurs um, from a uh, fall from a standing height or less or that occurs uh, during normal everyday activities with minor trauma that should not cause a fracture. These, these can be considered uh, pathologic fractures. Uh, patients with normal adult bone mass should be able to withstand normal forces and shouldn't necessarily fall from or have fractures from low energy. Um, this is a big problem. It's a big public health problem, as you'll see from the next couple of slides, which are saying the same thing over and over again. Uh, about a million and a half osteoporotic fractures a year, anywhere between 250 to 300,000 of those are hip fractures. Uh, a big portion of those are vertebral fractures, uh, about 400,000 wrist fractures, and this is estimated to increase by about 3 million per year up until 2025. Uh, just another way of looking at this. this lumps in some other fractures, so this is talking about a 2.1 million uh, prevalence of uh, fractures uh, per year. This is greater than strokes, greater than heart attacks, and greater than breast cancer. Hip fractures are a big deal. It's about uh, 10 to 20, uh, Dr. Lurai told us about 25% mortality with hip fractures at about a year. 20% uh, of these patients uh, require long-term care, and if you're in my hospital, it's probably about 80% of those don't go home right away. They go to a nursing facility for at least a month or so. Uh, vertebral fractures are found to have increased mortality. Uh, wrist fractures have decreased uh, productivity, uh, and it's about a $17 billion a year industry. Uh, so as orthopedic surgeons, and you, we were charged from 2001 to 2011 to own the bone, and we've kind of gotten away from that a little bit, um, but we might need to think about owning the bone and trying to help manage this whole uh, spectrum of disease process, even if we're not intimately involved in the whole thing, we can certainly be gatekeepers uh, and help get people in the pipeline. So osteoporosis from the National Osteoporosis Foundation is a disease characterized by low, bo low bone mass and structural deterioration of bone tissue, leading to bone fragility and an increased susceptibility to fractures, especially of the hip, spine, and wrist. Uh, we know that our peak bone mass happens in about uh, your late 20s, and after that, you just start losing bone mass. At that point, resorption uh, happens faster than remodeling, uh, but when resorption happens extremely um, faster than remodeling, then we end up with a pathologic state, which is called osteoporosis. So as orthopedic surgeons, we at least need to be mindful of this uh, and be able to guide our patients uh, in, in the direction they need to go in order to treat these problems. So we'll talk about how to diagnose it with DEXA scans. We'll talk about how to treat it with diet uh, and lifestyle modifications. We'll talk about how to treat it a little bit uh, by touching on some drugs, and then we'll talk about how to keep people from falling down, or if they do fall down, how we can mitigate the risk. So we need to assess fracture risk. We'll talk about the FRAX, which is a way to uh, get an absolute fracture risk assessment. Uh, and that's part of our uh, DEXA scan. Uh, and if you have a good, radio, uh, good relationship uh, with your radiology uh, department, uh, then they can help uh, facilitate getting uh, FRAX measurements added to your DEXA scans. Uh, they can also do vertebral fracture assessments at the same time, which will uh, check for the prevalence of vertebral fractures and the trabecular bone scores, uh, which will give you an idea of what your bone density in your spine is. So how do people get uh, this osteoporosis? They have lifestyle factors. So if you smoke, if you drink too much, if you don't exercise, and if you drink too much caffeine, there's certainly genetic uh, risk factors and there's medical risk factors, hypogonadism, malabsorption syndromes, rheumatoid arthritis, and medications that are associated with low bone mass and osteoporosis. Uh, we ne need to know who we need to get a DEXA scan in. Uh, in general, whether you have no risk factors at all, 
women over the age of 65 and men over the age of 70, and we should probably not forget our men because they can get osteoporosis as well, uh, regardless of risk factors. If you have younger postmenopausal women with risk factors in the age of 50 to 69, uh, then we need to think about getting a DEXA scan so we can start to measure their absolute fracture risk. Uh, and adults uh, who have a fracture over the age of 50. So we see distal radius fractures in 55-year-old women come in all the time. And I would say, even myself included, we're not always uh, recommending those people to have DEXA scans so that we can see if they're going to have an increased risk of fracture if they need to be treated over time. And certainly adults uh, with a medical condition that predisposes them to osteoporosis should be screened with a DEXA scan. DEXA scan is just a uh, radiologic uh, test. It doesn't take long to do. Uh, and this, uh, the central DEXA, which measures your spine and your hip, can give us uh, a relative indication of your bone uh, mineral density. And then that's reported back as either a T-score or a Z-score. The Z-score compares you to your peers, uh, but the T-score, which guides our treatment, is based off of peak bone mass in young normal adults. You might say that's not fair, but it's sort of, that's how it's, uh, how it's done. Uh, a normal T-score is within one standard deviation of the normal uh, control. A low bone density or osteopenia is defined as a T-score between uh, one, one and two and a half uh, standard deviations below a normal T-score. And you have a definition of osteoporosis if your T-score is two and a half uh, standard deviations or less, or if you have a fragility fracture of the hip or the spine, regardless uh, what your uh, T-score is. Uh, we know that the fracture risk doubles with every standard deviation uh, decrease in uh, bone mineral density. We know that your fracture uh, risk depends upon your bone mineral density and your age and that your risk factors are all additive. So how can we put all these together to decide who needs to be treated, when they should be treated, and what they should be treated with? And that's where the FRAX uh, tool comes in. And this can be done uh, from your nuclear medicine department or your radiology department when they do the DEXA scan. Uh, they can plug your risk factors into this uh, computer program and they can spit you out an absolute fracture score, um, which is your, your FRAC score. And we'll talk about a little bit how to use that later on. <clears throat> so how do we treat this now that we know people have osteoporosis because they've been diagnosed with the DEXA or they've, uh, they've had a fragility fracture? So the first thing we need to think about is the non formula pharmacologic treatment such as lifestyle uh, issues, which we'll talk about in a bit, as well as uh, dietary issues. And what we learn from dietary issues is that we need to have adequate intake of calcium and vitamin D. Uh, so our generally, patients that we're thinking of with fragility fractures or who have fractures, we should be thinking of about 600, or excuse me, 1,200 milligrams of elemental calcium a day um, total uh, from dietary and uh, medication sources. You can find some calculators online about how to figure out how much dietary calcium you take by how much milk you drink and green leafy vegetables, um, but unless you have a big history of uh, renal issues or gout, uh, it may be okay just to supplement your uh, calcium uh, with uh, medications such as OSCAL uh, or calcium carbonate. We know that we need vitamin D in order to metabolize our calcium, uh, and generally uh, in uh, you need somewhere between 800 to 1,000 international units of a, a day if you're in the fracture category. If you uh, are not in the fracture category, you're a little younger, you have an adequate diet uh, and get adequate sunlight, then you can be uh, maintained somewhere on the 600 international units per day. Um, but generally, uh, if you're in the fragility fracture uh, mind frame, uh, mindset, you should probably think uh, of getting your patients at least 800 uh, to 1,000 international units a day for uh, maintenance, and if you have severe vitamin D deficiency, you may need to be on the order of 50,000 units a week for a few months. So then once we uh, get out of the realm of diet and uh, dietary supplements, then we come into the realm of drugs. And who should be treated with drugs? So if you have a postmenopausal man or woman greater than 50 with a fragility fracture or with a clinical diagnosis of osteoporosis from a, uh, a DEXA scan that shows their T-score is less than 2.5, or they meet osteoporotic risk fracture um, risk from their fracs, meaning they have a 10-year absolute probability of a major osteoporotic fracture of 3% or a hip fracture of 20%, uh, 
or if they're on chronic steroid use, those people need to have something other than just diet and lifestyle modifications to manage their osteoporosis. And our first line of treatment is bisphosphonates. That's been that way for quite some time, and it continues even in the, this realm of uh, bisphosphonate fractures to be the recommended uh, first line treatment uh, for osteoporosis. They can be given either orally or IV. They can be given weekly, monthly, quarterly, or yearly. Uh, and they've all shown to uh, increase bone mineral density in the uh, spine and the hip, and some of them have shown to uh, decrease uh, pain as well associated with fractures. Um, there's a big controversy now about the length of bisphosphonate treatment. So before patients would be on a bisphosphonate, and we wouldn't be uh, unusual to say somebody had been on a bisphosphonate for seven to ten years or more. Uh, that has uh, come to mind now as we're seeing more of these uh, pathologic bisphosphonate-associated fractures. Bisphosphonates stay in your bloodstream and, uh, for a long time. They have a very long half-life. They're not metabolized. So even after stopping a bisphosphonate that you've been on for five years, there, you can still show increases in bone mineral density and decreases in fracture risk up to five years after stopping them. So they're safe to stop after a certain amount of time. And why do we need to think about stopping them? There's some theoretical risks of osteonecrosis of the jaw. Um, I think that's only in compromised patients. Uh, there's some uh, conflicting studies on increased risk of esophageal cancer, but the big thing that we think about as orthopedic surgeons are these atypical subtrochanteric femur fractures that are either transverse or short oblique. Uh, comes from having a dynamic bone or bone that show, is kind of brittle because it's not turning over. The bisphosphonates work by keeping your bone from uh, resorbing. So you may have some older bone sticking around. It makes your bone mineral density much greater. Uh, however, it makes it somewhat more brittle, and you can get these uh, adynamic uh, atypical fractures. Median duration of treatment of these patients who have had these atypical fractures are anywhere from uh, seven plus years. Um, so we've now come to the realm of a bisphosphonate holiday, meaning after you've been on bisphosphonates anywhere from three to five years, depending on your fracture risk, you should have a rest of about two years. If you have a very high risk, uh, of fracture after being uh, on bisphosphonates for greater than five years, then there are other medications that we can think of bridging you with during your bisphosphonate holiday. Uh, we, because of this uh, known thought of um, decreasing bone remodeling, we think about bone remodeling needs to happen uh, in order to get fracture care. There's some, ri there's some concern about placing patients on bisphosphonates right after you fixed a fracture. Uh, but there have been a few trials that have shown that it's safe to uh, start bisphosphonate therapy within uh, a week to three months after uh, obtaining a fracture and fixing a fracture without any adverse effect on fracture healing. So when you can't use bisphosphonates, the next thing that we think about is uh, anabolic agents such as Forteo or teriparatide. It's an anabolic uh, analog of parathyroid hormone. There's a new abaliparatide, which I think just got approved uh, recently, uh, that's similar to this. Uh, and this may be the treatment of choice for bisphosphonate failures. Uh, the issue with teriparatide, it is expensive. It requires a daily subcutaneous injection. It has to be refrigerated. Uh, if you go out of town, you've got to take it with you. If you come to my hospital, it's not on formularies. So the lady I just brought in uh, last week had to bring her own stash with her to, to stay on it. We, there's a small risk of uh, osteosarcoma. You want to avoid its use in uncontrolled gout patients. Uh, and this can be considered first-line uh, treatment in people who have severe osteoporosis. <clears throat> so we tend to use this in patients who have failed bisphosphonate. So if you have a fracture on a bisphosphonate, if you've had prolonged bisphosphonate use, but you still have low bone density during your uh, bisphosphonate holiday, uh, or if you can't tolerate bisphosphonates because you don't want to sit up for 30 minutes every day after you take a pill and not eat for a half an hour after you take a pill, then you may consider anabolic agents. Uh, a newer uh, thing that's on the market is denosumab uh, or Prolia. That's a monoclonal antibody binds to the rank L and helps to also inhibit osteoclast formation. Uh, this is given as a sub-Q injection every six months. Uh, this can be considered first-line treatment in certain uh, patients, whether you've either had a prior bisphosphonate failure or it may be first-line treatment if you have men with androgen deprivation because of prostate cancer or some other reason, or women with breast cancer on aromatase inhibitors. This may be a better um, 
first line treatment, or if you have people who also have an autoimmune disease that runs through the rank pathway, such as ulcerative colitis, they may be better treated uh, with denosumab as a first line uh, treatment. So in general, uh, oral bisphosphonates like alendronate, residronate, Beneva, uh, they're cheap and effective. They're good first-line agents, uh, even in patients who have had a fracture. Uh, nosumab can be considered a good first-line agent as well. Uh, and terapyrtide is second-line treatment unless uh, patients have uh, severe risk factors. Uh, and then finally, just to, to talk about uh, some of the uh, lifestyle modifications, is that we want to try to keep our patients from falling. Uh, and if that, that's the biggest risk factor for having a fracture, even bigger than just having osteoporosis. Um, you want to change some of the lifestyle factors. You can stop smoking, appropriate nutrition, make sure people can see very well. And there's some, uh, there was some uh, hip protector uh, talk several years ago about uh, patients who are at risk of falling, putting hip protectors on them so that if they do fall, there's less chance of fracture. Uh, physical therapy and occupational therapy have been shown to be very uh, beneficial in preventing falls uh, and uh, increasing patients' uh, functional activity after hip fractures. Uh, and our hospital has now just put in a safe steps program, which is run by one of the physiatrists uh, and some physical therapists. It is a uh, self-referral source. Um, you don't doesn't run through insurance. They don't do active treatment, but what they do uh, is they talk about fall prevention and show uh, some lifestyle and activity modifications uh, for older people who may be at risk of falling to try to decrease their risk of fractures. So what do we do as the orthopedist? We stabilize and we treat the fractures. We need to recognize when a fragility fracture has occurred and we need to get the ball rolling to make sure that we get the appropriate uh, tests. We make sure the patients are followed up on whether they're on their appropriate diet uh, and uh, medications, uh, and then we can refer them for physical therapy and exercise, and then get them to a bone health specialist that may need to uh, start them uh, on uh, more higher level uh, medications. So back to our patient. Uh, intertrochanteric hip fracture, early surgery within uh, 24 hours, out of bed within the next 24 hours, calcium and vitamin D initiated in the hospital, Fracture liaison consultation and referral to an outpatient uh, fracture uh, or uh, osteoporosis specialist uh, and the Safe Steps program, bisphosphonate initiation in the hospital and communication with the primary care physician. Thank you.